Um, I'm really excited to be here and uh, share with you some recent work that we've been doing at Los Alamos on how to model um, dislocation grain boundary interactions. So before I get started, I first want to show the team of folks that have been working on this problem with me. Um, I, I'll note what I'm showing here is sort of a subset of the project that we're working on. So this is the whole team, the folks who are have their names bolded are folks who really contributed specifically to the work that I am showing today, which is a lot going to be a lot about atomistic to mesoscale connections and, and different pathways that we're pursuing to sort of make that connection. Um, but as part of this project, we also have an experimental thrust and also a macro scale um, crystal plasticity thrust. And so there are folks working on the same problem from those aspects as well, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, before I get into kind of the nitty gritty of what we're doing, I'd like to give kind of the problem that we're interested in, in really addressing. And in essence, this is focused at capturing the effect of microstructure on the mechanical uh, response of metals. So an, a good example, this is what's being shown here of this, is we see here one sample that's been additively manufactured and another sample uh, that's been cast. This is stainless steel. And it's really obvious that the uh, gray morphology between these two samples are very different. And this correlates to a difference in sort of the macro scale mechanical response, which is shown in the stress strain curves over here. And in particular, there's a big difference between the yield stresses of these two materials. So, so this is the kind of thing that we're interested in capturing with predictive modeling approaches. And, and this is certainly a problem that lots of folks within the community are trying to address and, and, and do a similar thing. So what I'm going to show here is kind of our approach to it. And to do that, we're starting at the atomistic scale. Like I said, I'm going to talk a lot about going from atomistic scale to mesoscale. And um, you know, why start there is maybe one question. And so I think what we're kind of saying is we still need to improve and better understand what's happening at grain boundaries and with dislocation grain boundary interactions at this scale. So recent work here has shown that, you know, if you travel along a grain boundary, the structure of the grain boundary can change. And so those are the sorts of things we want to be able to capture in our meso and macro scale models to, to better capture how dislocations might interact with a bit grain boundary. And so we're saying we think the reaction that could happen with this structure has a good chance or might be different than the reaction that will happen at this structure. And if you have a polycrystal with lots of grain boundaries and lots of varying structures and lots of dislocation grain boundary interactions, this will in turn in, impact your overall mechanical response of the material. So kind of a brief outline, I've already kind of given you the broad problem of interest. I'm going to go kind of into our atomic work that we've been doing, which is um, building a database of dislocation grain boundary interactions um, with molecular dynamics, and then connecting to the mesoscale, which is a phase field dislocation dynamics model, and talk about a couple new features that we've implemented there. And then actually I kind of go back to the atomistic scale. So I'm going to talk about different places where we're trying to make connections across these scales. This is all work that we're currently doing. So, you know, how established those connections are, you can argue with me as I go along. Um, <laughs> but this is, I'm going to show you what we're trying to do. Um, so our current atomic database is right now focused on copper. And we have included these two symmetric tilt boundaries. And what we're doing is we're taking a dislocation, um, either an edge, a screw, screw, or a mixed type dislocation, and driving it towards our grain boundary of interest here. And then we're doing that for a wide range of conditions, different stress states, different uh, grain boundaries, and, and classifying the reaction, whether there is repulsion, pinning, and an absorption, or transmission of either a partial or a full dislocation. And before I get into what the database is actually looking like, I want to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about our setup and why we've chosen to 
to generate the, the database with the setup that we did. Because depending on, on how you set up the simulation, you can actually get different results. Um, so we've tested two simulations. Um, this one here where you have a straight uh, grain boundary and periodic boundary conditions. Or this one where you basically have an inclined grain boundary and fixed boundary conditions. Um, you know, there's maybe nothing particularly novel about either of these setups. This one, I think, tends to get used often in the literature because your dislocation glide plane is horizontal in this case, and it's easy to apply a shear stress and, and drive it towards your boundary in kind of a, a, a straightforward way. Um, but in testing both of these, so we've tested both of these setups for um, this grain boundary up here with an edge dislocation driving at it. And I know there's, there's kind of a lot of, to fit all these figures in, I, ha I can't make the text too large, unfortunately. Um, this first column here is showing the reaction that we see when you drive the dislocation towards the grain boundary. And I think what actually turned us on to really testing and you know, drilling down into these setups, is you can see whether we use the, the straight boundary and periodic boundary conditions versus the inclined boundary and the fixed boundary conditions, you actually get two different reactions coming out of your dislocation grain boundary interaction. Um, so we want to understand why. So each of these rows are also taking into account our uh, simulation box size, whether you're varying the x, the y or the z direction. The z direction is along the dislocation line, so it's kind of coming out of the plane at you. Um, and you can see, of course, we don't really see a big effect on um, stress states if we vary that box size. But if you look at um, some of the other cases, you actually, even though for all these different stress states, we're not necessarily seeing a change in our reaction, um, you are seeing that you need to have a big enough box size that you have stress convergence. And so this is what we started to look into of why maybe we see different reactions with different simulation setups. So looking at these stress fields, you can see here comparing these two cases for two different box sizes. When you have the um, fixed boundaries, you start to see kind of these localized stress regions maybe in the corners of your box. And if you have a small box, you can see here where maybe this region here is starting to impact maybe your grain boundary region. And maybe that's giving you um, some impact on your dislocation grain boundary interactions. Now, if you look at the straight boundary case, you can argue that these are still present in this case as well in, in the corners. Um, but, you know, I guess you can argue these are bigger or not, but we wanted to look at it a little more quantitatively. So we compared, um, looking at the different stress um, components for both this fixed boundary and this periodic boundary case. And you can see there's lots of fluctuations. There, these are all the normal stress components and these are the shear stress components. Um, in most cases, for the fixed um, boundary conditions or this inclined grain boundary case, you see sort of larger fluctuations than in the periodic boundary case, except for this one case here. Um, but you also have to pay a little bit of attention to the um, axes here because, um, you know, here you might see variations that are the order of, you know, 20 MPA, which is, is maybe not so significant, but if you go over here, these variations, even though they look small, are spanning a much wider range. So, but when you change the periodic, that's a different physics, right? So you yeah. have like periodic uh, images of the same. Yeah, you here. do have periodic images of the same grain boundary, and I think you know that was another motivation for testing the size of your box. You know, at what point do you have a box size that's big enough that the effect of your periodic images is low? So. So, is it, so there, there are two, if you go back to that image, sorry, so on the, there's a second grain at the boundary, is that right, or is it on the, in the y direction, there's the, are there two grains here? This um, for this periodic? Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, if this is grain one and this is grain two, if you were to tessellate that yeah. one more, you would get like another grain one here, 
and right, another so, green so, so that high stress is coming from a grain boundary effectively on the periodic image. Right, and I think probably the reason that you're getting kind of these more like stress concentration, I mean, you can see they're a little bit present here at the grain boundary, um, but you know, I would have to think about how like this boundary here is relaxed in comparison to like this green boundary here in the middle, right? So this might not be as relaxed as this case, which is why you might see some stress concentrations. But like I said, as you increase sort of the distance or the size of this box, you know, the idea is that these will, you know, hopefully be far enough away that it's not impacting what's going on here, right? And you can see in the small, smaller box case, yeah, you are getting close to your grain boundary with those stress states. So it's something you have to pay attention to. I think the point is, is it's also present in this case, even though you don't have the periodic boundary conditions, and that's a function of probably having a fixed boundary there. And you have pure shear here, the loading is? Yeah, so it's an applied stress state. In this case, your applied stress is a pure shear that's, you know, just driving along this glide plane to drive your dislocation. In this case, the stress state has to be a little bit more complicated because you have to drive, uh, you have to apply a global stress state that, um, where the components essentially kind of nullify to give you the same applied shear stress on this, on, um, sorry, the resolved, the same resolved shear stress on an inclined glide plane. Does that make sense? So the stress states that you're applying should provide the same resolved shear stress on your gliding dislocation towards the dislocation, but if you compare them just across the, exper across the simulations, they're going to look different. Abby, do you, yeah. have, do you have these connections? Do you know if you have these connections on, on that gray boundary that could um, used to stress distributions like that. I'm thinking of a couple of boundary motion, like you're applying shear stress. Mm -hmm. Boundaries can't move, right, in response to that and deform the box. So if you're fo forcing the box to stay right. within a certain geometric shape, you may induce stresses there. And that. So I think, in, that's a good question. I think in this case, this specific case, the answer is no, but you'll see as we go to the database where we start looking at these green boundaries in some cases, or you know, a bunch of different grain boundaries and a bunch of different stresses, you will see that some simulations, I mean, I don't know if failed is the right word, but we couldn't really process those results because of shear coupling and, and is exactly the problem you mentioned. So it is something you have to be aware of, and actually in some ways we maybe kind of lose a little data to those cases because we can't, we don't get a clear dislocation grain boundary reaction in the same way. One very quick question. Yep. Uh, I'll give you extra time at the end. So, because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, so, there's a lots of there's, with the stress of the, I guess the transfer of the motion there, but also the stress of the grain field. Can you evaluate effectively what the peach curler force is on this dislocation? Because if I know what the stress state is, I know what the dislocation stress state is. Can I maybe look at what that effective force on the dislocation is at that? Right. Um, so. That's a good question, and, and I meant my specific expertise is not in the MD here. Um, but you know, I think I think to do that, you have to have kind of an area, right, over which you're calculating your stress. So I mean, that might impact, I guess, maybe the force that you're getting out. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So I think, like I said, I'm winging it a little bit here. I think it's possible, but um, you have to be careful about it. Um, although there's probably folks in, in here that know the answer to that question better than I do. <laughs> so someone can correct me at the break or, or now they can speak up too. Um, so, okay, any, any other questions? No? All right, so getting back to the slide I showed already. So now I'm gonna kind of dive in. So, so we've gone with this periodic boundary setup and that's what we chose to build our database on and so now we've done a lot of simulations for these two types of symmetric tilt boundaries at um, these three stresses um, with different dislocations and people on the grain boundary I you know when I made this slide was a little while ago we've extended this somewhat um, and I'll try to note some places where we've been extending it but we're working on including more types of um, grain boundaries um, and also extending some of the stress range that we're applying and things like that as well. 
So the other thing that we're including in this database is instead of just modeling the minimum energy structure for the grain boundaries, we're including a bunch of the metastable states. So uh, this is showing kind of all the possibilities for these two um, dislocations. And the red dots are, are the points that we've selected to test in our database. And so these are approximately been in, in you know, differences about of energy, of grain boundary energy of about 30 millijoules um, per meter squared. And they all include sort of the lowest and the highest energy state. So you can see how this database starts to really grow uh, quite quickly if you start thinking of doing this for lots of different types of grain boundaries plus impinging different types of dislocations on them. Um, one thing that we're kind of extending our, our database on that we have that I'm not going to show here is you know does your reaction matter depending on where along the grain boundary your dislocation impinges or, or questions like that. But what's interesting is once you start to get a bunch of data you can start to kind of look at it in aggregate which is sort of interesting. Um, so here's an edge dislocation impinging on a 112 type tilt boundary and so these are split up into whether it's pinned repelled from the dislocation or absorbed. You'll notice there's no transmission uh, in, in these cases. So one of the things we're doing, or actually have done kind of already, I'm just not showing it here, is applying higher stresses to see at what point you start to get um, the transmission occurring. For the screw dislocation and the mixed type dislocation, impinging on a 110 tilt boundary, you can, again, see kind of the breakdown where we have a big portion of our reactions are pinning or absorption type of reaction. And then there's also the light green is partial dislocation transmission. And then we have sort of these small cases of, of dark green, which are a full dislocation transmission, which is both the leading and the trailing dislocation has um, passed through the grain boundary. And so, you know, as you go up in stress, I mean, it's interesting to see things. I think some of these things are, are things you might expect. As, as you go up in stress, you start to see less absorption and pinning behavior and more transmission behavior. Um, in particular, more partial dislocation transmission, although the transmission of your uh, full dislocation is um, increasing some as well. Um, maybe what's interesting to think about is, you know, at this low stress, what's happening when the screw and the mixed type dislocation and pins looks pretty similar. Um, but as you go up to the high stress in the case where the screw dislocation is impinging on, on the grain boundary, you actually see a much larger increase in transmission than in the mixed dislocation case. So, you know, there's some complex interactions happening between the mixed and, uh, or the dislocation type and the grain boundary structure. What well, yeah, does partial transmission, how do you actually, like, look at that? Is it just, like you can still identify the partial ahead. So you, you, these things are always wide enough that you can kind of tell when the partial has gone through. Yeah, and I think also when the leading partial goes through and not the trailing, you have a stacking fault emitted behind it. So you can see that as well. Yep. Uh, what's the difference in pinning and repulsion? Is it like a standoff that the solution doesn't quite go to the... Yeah, so in the case of repulsion, that's a good question. Actually, the stress state is... I mean, I think of it as a low stress state to me, although you can see it's present in both sort of our low and middle cases. But yeah, you drive the dislocation towards the boundary and once it gets close enough to the boundary to really feel the stress state there, it actually repels. And so it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. So the stress state is not, is not large enough to um, overcome, I guess, the repulsion between the dislocation and, and the structure of the grain boundary. Does that make sense? Um, so this is the same data, just plotted a little bit in a different way where now we're looking at, looking at it as a function of um, grain boundary energy versus misorientation. And so like each of these points are colored based on their reaction. And so, um, in this case, the sort of the dark blue is repulsion, the light blue is pinning, and these yellow points are the absorption. And then down in these cases here, um, the light green is, is pinning and absorption kind of combined. And then you have um, 
the red and the orange are kind of hard um, to tell the difference, but the orange is the a partial transmission and, and the red, you can kind of see popping up some cases are, are the full dislocation transmission. Um, again, you see similar trends. For example, you can see that there's more transmission occurring in these cases, you know, versus these cases, which we saw on the previous slide. When you look at the data like this, you can see that actually most of our transmission is happening at our lower misorientation boundaries, which is something I think you would probably expect to see. Uh, what I think is most interesting about these plots, which you have to look at it very carefully, which I've done a lot of in the past little while, is there are cases that um, where the minimum energy structure is giving one reaction, where the metastable structures give a different reaction. And, and that's sort of one of the main motivations of a lot of the work we're doing is we're saying that if you do have um, metastable or varying grain boundary structures in the material, it could impact the um, type of reaction that your dislocation could have when it impinges on a grain boundary. And in aggregate, that, that goes into determining your mechanical response. Yep. Very nice plot. So do you think this map will evolve when you have sub uh, sequential reaction? Yes. Third one come, this map will change? Yeah, and so that's something that we're thinking. So that's definitely a question that's on our minds, but we don't, I guess we haven't really dug into it yet. But yeah, I, I think that when you have one dislocation move through a ground, grain boundary, you could change the structure there locally. So if a dislocation, another dislocation comes through in the same area, it's possible that it will have a different reaction because of that localized grain boundary structure change. Um, and then if it were to transmit too, then maybe you have another change, right? And so how significant those changes are, I'm not sure. Um, and you know how to classify those changes, I think what I'm going to show next are some tools we can can use to start doing that, um, but we haven't done it yet. Um, so this is just kind of a quick summary of, of the database that we have, um, where you know this is kind of showing all of the data for all three stress states kind of combined for um, each of these cases. Again, this is expand this database has expanded since. I first kind of put some of this stuff together because we're sort of continuing to grow it as we move forward. But I think maybe one thing to put out there, because you know we've actually seen a lot of interesting work about um, people dealing with um, all sorts of different types of big data. But I think this is sort of a big data case. Um, and, and even looking at it like this, it's hard to really pull out some of the fine details that you might want to know about, too. So no, that's, that's something we're dealing with, too. Yep. So to, uh, to make these uh, diagrams, do you account for like, a local energy? Uh, what, are, what are your, like, how do you co compute these percentages? Is it sort of the amount of energy uh, associated with dislocation versus? Uh... No, so this is like out of this number of reactions, 74.5% oh, okay. of them were absorption. Um, Have you looked at actual energy? I don't know if it's easy to do with these calculations, but like, you know, like local energy associated with, you know, say, distribution itself and... Yeah, I mean, I think we have, I guess we haven't looked at, like, maybe how the energy state as the dislocation impinges on the grain boundary, like, changes through the process. You know, the energy we've mostly looked at is sort of just what the initial grain boundary energy is. Does that answer your question? Um, so now talking about kind of how to scale this up to the mesoscale, I'm going to just um, briefly inter introduce um, this method that we're using called um, strain functional descriptors. And this is a way of mapping atomic quantities to continuum fields and, um, and using a Gaussian kernel. I can get the rest of my pictures here. Um, this can be performed on any scalar vector quantity. However, for our purpose, which is a, um, describing atomic environments, we, pour, we perform the mapping on the local density. So this is similar to SOAP or SNAP descriptors, which we've heard about some in um, this workshop and the previous workshop, actually. So um, some of you, I know, are familiar with that. So we then write the uh, Taylor series expansion of the local number density 
um, and the terms of which um, appear are analytical um, due to the Gaussian kernel. And so we can write this out to whatever order we want, um, making these symmetry adapted. And so here, um, these are the ones that speak the most to me because they can be tied to the strain and the strain gradients. Um, and so the idea is that as you do this mapping, you can start to get this information. And in particular, when I show the phase field model, um, something like being able to get strains um, from these different atomic environments is something that we can start to think about inputting into our model. Um, so this is just showing, you know, I like these kind of connections here, <laughs> I guess the pictures. Um, you know, going from strain gradients, you can start to get things like curvature and twist um, from these different atomic environments. So uh, taking, um, taking this and applying it to grain boundaries, so some of the grain boundaries from our atomic database, um, we, take the, um, we take these grain boundaries here, so we have a bunch of um, these different energy states, we pick one from each of them, which is marked with the arrow, and we classify them with the SFDs. And so they're, they're shown here, um, increasing in energy. And, and you start to see these clusters. So what it means when you see these sort of tight clusters, like in these two cases, is that that grain boundary can be sort of well classified with the SFDs in the sense that it can be classified with a few SFDs, where a few is maybe six to eight SFDs. And so here, these sort of blue regions, these are regions that are very close to sort of the FCC structure. And then you see there are some other ones sort of present in this grain boundary. So as you go up in grain boundary energy, you start to see sort of more amorphous structures emerging. So here, you start to see that here. And then as you go up again, you start to see tight clusters. So there are definitely, you know, like as we pursue this a method and sort of classifying these different grain boundaries, there are definitely higher energy grain boundary structures and metastable states that we can use F SFDs um, to classify, which was something we had to learn. Um, and then, of course, when you go very high, um, you know, this a full kind of amorphous structure has has sort of formed out of um, out of that case there. Um, so that's a, you know, that's an example of a case that's maybe more difficult for us to classify or is going to take a lot of um, SFDs to, to really try to classify it. Um, if we start to apply this to a grain boundary, so um, again, this is uh, um, sigma 11, um, 112 symmetric tilt boundary. And um, this is an example of a grain boundary here that's colored by a cosine similarity metric that's calculated using sort of the average SFDs in a local area. And so the local area is taken by like a 10 angstrom by 10 angstrom box sort of in areas along here. This sort of highlighted area here is where the dislocation is impinging on um, or has impinged on the um, grain boundary. So we do this for several different grain boundary structures and then correlate this to the dislocation reaction, we can start to look at plots like this. So we have our cosine similarity here where um, higher energy structures tend to have less similarity um, versus grain boundary energy here. And then these different um, uh, colors here are um, the reaction that we're seeing. And so like we have ignore here, that's like a case where we had the shear coupling mechanism that was mentioned earlier. <laughs> um, so you can see they do turn up. Um, you can see that like pinning um, and even kind of um, emission, they're calling it emission here, but um, you know, transfer through the boundary is kind of distributed, but then you know, the absorption you can maybe start to say is starting to kind of cluster. Um, up in sort of these higher grain boundary regions. So, you know, this is sort of a limited data set maybe. And as we expand, you know, maybe you start to see more trends coming out or, or maybe not. That's something that we're, we're learning. So switching gears a little bit, um, 
sort of to our mesoscale step now. So we did um, atomistics. SFDs is sort of how we're trying to take that big database and sort of pare it down into something that we can start to use to go higher. Um, phase field dislocation dynamics is sort of that next scale of model or the next step in our pathway. And so I won't go into too much detail on the formulation unless um, folks have questions. But in this approach, you know, we say that um, plastic strain is mediated by the motion and interaction of dislocations. Dislocations are essentially represented with sort of a scalar valued order parameter or phase field value where, um, you know, zero would represent an area where no slip has occurred. One would represent where a dislocation has, a perfect dislocation has slipped a glide plane. And then the transition between zero and one would represent where your dislocation core dislocation line is. And so these are defined based on, you know, the number of slip systems you have in a material, for example. Um, using this, we develop a uh, total system energy, which is, um, depending on the system that you want to model, um, can have some different terms, but we tend to have sort of a, um, a strain energy term, a, a term that describes sort of uh, the interaction between dislocations and um, externally applied force, and a lattice energy term, which, and I'll explain these a little bit on the next slide. Once you have this, which will be a function of your order parameter, you can minimize the total system energy using this equation here, and that will evolve your dislocation configuration and your simulation, and you can see what happens. So looking at the um, energy terms briefly, um, like I said, there's an external interaction term which is just describing your applied stress, uh, the effect of your applied stress on your dislocation. So here you can see the plastic strain is written here, but remember that's a direct function of your order parameter field or your phase field variables. Um, you also have the strain energy which is describing dislocation-dislocation interactions. And I'll just note here that to calculate this term, um, we use a sort of a Fourier transform, fast Fourier transform. So everything that I'm going to show as far as results for the phase field method will have periodic boundary conditions. Um, and then the lattice energy. So this energy, or this term is describing the energy expended as dislocations glide through a crystal lattice. Um, this is sort of written in maybe the most general term you can think of. Uh, this term tends to be um, modified um, depending, for example, on what kind of materials, whether you're looking at an FCC or a BCC or an HCP material, for example. Um, this is the formulation for the results that I'm going to show, which I'm actually shifting gears a little bit. What I'm going to show as results from the phase field approach is actually going to be looking at uh, BCC uh, metal, even though our uh, database that I was showing was for copper. Um, but this approach has been applied to FCC, BCC, and HCP metals, and um, even a little bit of work on some uh, semiconductor materials, and, and that's just sort of my, my work. Um, so other groups have also um, extended it in other ways for various materials. Um, so I showed this sort of energy minimization equation already. Currently, what the model does is it reaches or relaxes to an athermal energy minimum. And what we've done to um, sort of extend this is to integrate a kinetic Monte Carlo algorithm within the three field approach. And, um, you know, what I'm going to talk about in terms of this is sort of a lot towards modeling thermal activation, but I hope to also give some motivation of how we can connect this to SFDs as well to think about um, also modeling sort of variations and energy barriers along a grain boundary. Um, so I'm sure many of you are familiar with these equations, uh, um, you know, calculating the rate for some event to happen. And I'm going to be a little bit broad here because you know, actually this could be really generally applied to a lot of different cases. So, you know, you can use your imagination to what you think an event, what the event might be. Um, and then, of course, here, um, some of the energy barrier and activation volumes I'll show is information that we're informing from atomistics. 
And then um, ultimately what we're getting out is sort of a wait time. Um, you know, how long your dislocation segment or um, whatever you need to wait will wait until your event happens. Um, this is sort of a schematic view um, of how this is sort of implemented in, in the phase field models for those of you who kind of think in that way. Um, you know, we start off running phase field the way we normally would with our standard energy minimization. Um, say you have a dislocation gliding. Um, the event that I'm going to show is for a dislocation impinging on a boundary. Surprise, surprise. Um, and so, you know, maybe your dislocation is just gliding. Um, it's going to test to see if sort of your event has happened. Has your dislocation impinged on your boundary? Has whatever you're looking for that is your thermally activated mechanism happened? And when that happens, um, that's when it sort of enters, you know, the phase field kind of standard evolution stops and it enters the KMC part of the algorithm. And what it does is it, cal it calculates you know, your wait times, maybe you have several, if you have, say, several dislocation segments impinging along a boundary, each of those segments will have some wait time. And, and then essentially it asks, you know, has the segment waited long enough? And if the answer is no, then it just keeps waiting. Um, if the answer is yes, then the KMC kind of opens the door, so to speak, to let your segment through your boundary or lets your event happen. And then you kind of go back into your normal phase field routine until your event is triggered again. Um, perhaps that could be if your dislocation meets another interface or a subsequent dislocation impinges on the same interface, for example. Um, so to show some results of what this looks like, um, you know, here we have a dislocation loop impinging on an interface. Um, you know, here are some values that we've input into this case. This is for tungsten. Um, these material parameters are all informed by molecular dynamics. In this case, we started with sort of some representative um, or hypothetical values here, which um, was mostly chosen so we could have simulations run quickly, so we could test that our algorithm was doing what we wanted it to, um, which I hope to show you that it is. Um, so we can run at different temperatures. So 500K versus 300K. Um, you can see that the times that it's going to wait, you know, are pretty significant with these being about an order of magnitude longer than these. It's just mm -hmm. time or steps. This is time. It's like KMC accumulated time. Yeah, so that, well, so this is actually like the difference between your KMC time and the time that your segment has waited. Um, or I guess, well, okay, let me back up. That's confusing. Um, the dots here along our interface are colored with values that are on this um, scale bar. The scale bar is the wait time, but these points here are, um, you know, you will see change along these because it's showing the delta. So if something starts at red over here and is waiting a long time, it would become yellow and then it would be, become blue and then it would get let through. Does that kind of make sense? Um, Sorry, I didn't do a good job of answering that to start. But, but yeah, these are actual, um, so, I mean, these, I guess, time are, you know, these are kind of normalized in the way they're unitless, but in the algorithm, we are actually calculating a physical time um, for the physical wait time, and we're calculating a physical time step that the phase field model is calculating. And, and actually, that took a little bit of doing, because those of you who are familiar with phase field models um, or even Pyro's Navarro models, a lot of times they normalize everything. So we kind of almost had to back up <laughs> and like unnormalize things to figure out what our time was. And um, in this paper that um, we have, we actually kind of go into a little more detail on how we do it. Um, it, it wasn't as trivial as I had hoped it would have been when I started that process. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, moving on, um, of course, in the calculation of the wait time, there's sort of a random number um, taken into account to give you some statistics. So um, these are the same times with just two different random number seeds. You can see like here you don't see the same difference in our KMC time that we're looking at. 
And, and ultimately, you kind of see the same behavior of the loop, although you know, maybe you see some kind of differences in your loop shape early on, things like that. So I think we're getting results we are expecting to. Um, and so the next step was to try a grain boundary that was a little more realistic. So again, we're working in tungsten. Um, we sort of parameterized these values a little more accurately with MD. Um, and we included a line character dependence in our um, lattice energy. So you know now the screw dislocations have a higher energy barrier to overcome due to their non-planar core versus the edge type dislocations. Um, and then we test it. So in this case, we actually put a, a gray boundary or you know a boundary on both sides of the dislocation here. And a mixed part of the dislocation is impinging on the gray boundary. So these are showing the same case here. Um, what's different is um, this is just showing sort of what the order parameter looks like. Um, this has outlined sort of a region that we have identified as the dislocation line or the center of the dislocation. And um, again, it was also some work to kind of do that in a way that we could really use within the algorithm. And if you want to talk about it after this, I'm happy to give you more of the details. Um, I think what's interesting to see about this case is different from what we kind of had in the hypothetical case. You see a lot more kind of small segments um, crossing the boundary while maybe the segment next to it is stuck. Um, so you almost get these, um, you can kind of see it here, like these fingers or small areas of bowed out regions starting to go until they either sort of coalesce outside of, of the points that are stuck or, um, you know, which maybe you kind of are seeing down here, or one of these points are released and a bigger segment can bow out. Um, so that's kind of different. Now, whether or not that is physical of what you might expect to see, um, I think is to be determined because I, I think the thing that we're missing in these boundaries is capturing sort of a local stress state around there. Um, and I think that might um, impact whether or not some segments could uh, transition through your interface. Um, so this is just another case of different random number seed. You can see in this case, like we see the bigger kind of bow out region at this top interface versus previously it was kind of at the bottom interface. So again, you're seeing similar KMC times, but you know, maybe on a statistical scale, different behavior. Um, yep. I mean, do you, I assume that you enforce Bernard's vector conservation in the junctions in the, where you have partial transmission. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you checked that you have a different type of dislocation compared to the original one? Um, so I haven't specifically checked that, but the sort of character of the dislocation of course, is you know based on the curvature, and that sort of naturally comes out, I guess, of the phase field model in the sense that um, the Burgess vector is going to be all the same direction, say. And so, if your dislocation curves in an energetically favorable way, you're automatically creating different character types. So, so the Burgess vector is the same, but it could be a mixed type, or a screw type, or an edge type, and that will evolve kind of on its own. Does that make sense? Um, these sort of here are the kind of long screw dislocations that are forming. And actually what's not shown here is if you let these parts bow out to where you get kind of a bigger loop, these do actually end up gliding and, and annihilating with their periodic images. I think even though these kind of have a higher energy barrier, so they will sort of be stuck in some ways, um, compared to sort of the more mobile mixed type and edge type dislocations. It does show that, that this case is really in kind of a thermally activated regime in the sense that we're not applying a stress that gives you free glide of your dislocation line. So, just a, um, so I'm gonna move on kind of from this KMC stuff. I think where this connects to the SFDs is you know, right now we sort of have just a constant energy barrier for this uh, along the grain boundary, like I mentioned, sort of capturing local effects. 
and ultimately when we want to be able to capture grain boundary structure. So if a grain boundary like this can be classified with SFDs and say there are multiple SFDs that are, um, you know, or to say multiple atomic environments that are present along this grain boundary, you could think of having a spatially varying energy barrier informed by SFDs that could start to capture structure. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we're heading. Um, five minutes, I think, I have left. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not going to go into this too much on the phase field side, um, but I am kind of going to talk in the next few slides about what we're doing on the SFD scale to inform um, this kind of a um, feature in phase field. And essentially the idea here is to be able to capture regions of elastic and homogeneity. And so traditionally what this has been done with an Eschel B inclusion method, um, and it's been done before in this method for bimetals, for voids, for precipitates. And you know, you have one region here, which is your matrix material, and you have another region here, which is your inhomogeneity, say, and you have some non-zero eigenstrains or virtual strains to account for the difference in elasticity. I think you, many folks here are kind of familiar with this idea. What we'd like to do is, um, instead of thinking of these two regions as, say, two different materials, um, we could start to think of them as two different um, grains, right, where one grain is um, rotated with respect to the other. But really what we would like to do is think of our inhomogeneous region as like our grain boundary region. So now we're starting to give some width or some um, volume to our grain boundary. Um, and also we're saying that, you know, we feel like our grain boundary region is going to have a different stiffness tensor that could be one way to capture sort of a variation in structure. So we're using sort of the um, atomic database. I'm switching back to copper and what we've done on the atomic scale now and SFDs. Um, and this is just showing, you know, if we color this with, you know, kind of a standard CNA analysis or if we use our, um, an, this is using an unsupervised Gaussian mixture model where the SFDs have been used as features to train the model. Um, you can see we actually get kind of a, a grain boundary region here. And so we're using, you know, we can measure some width here and we want to also measure sort of the um, stiffness tensor in this region. Um, to pass to phase field um, to inform our new kind of um, virtual strain or Eschel B inclusion approach. So um, the variation in energy density is determined from the grain boundary region, and we take these lowest nine points um, to kind of fit these parabolas that you're seeing here. And then these values are used to calculate the full stiffness tensor. And so um, this is kind of an example of what you get here. Um, and this is an example for sort of our, our favorite 112 symmetric tilt boundary um, that we've been kind of talking about a lot in this presentation. If we do that, we can do it for a lot of um, different grain boundaries here. And so I'll note in these cases, um, these are only the minimum energy structures that I'm showing so far. And again, you can see there's some here that we sort of highlighted as failed due to the shear coupling um, problem. So it, do, it does kind of happen in these cases. Um, and then just looking at, um, you know, what this looks like. So, you know, we're kind of plotting our um, Voigt and Royce averages for the shear modulus, where these two are here, the Voigt average, and these are the Royce. Um, you know, we have our shear modulus here and the either misorientation on these um, x-axis or the grain boundary energy. Um, and, you know, I think it's hard to pull out a clear trend from any of these plots. I think one main takeaway is compared to the bulk value for um, copper, you know, what you're getting for all these different, you know, grain boundaries is, is widely varying. Um, so, you know, I think this is to say that the um, stiffness tensor in the grain boundary can vary quite a bit from what's in the bulk. Yep. I would like to ask you, because if you introduce your SLBA inclusion like um, grain boundary, yep. you can have in both sides the interface energy between your matrix and this inclusion. Mm -hmm. How you fit it, and uh, with respect to this, you know, have the size of mesh, which is literally defined by this interface energy. 
Right. So in this case, we um, don't have sort of a specific interface energy for that. Well, the way the grain boundary, you know, the way it's seen an interface sort of between like your grain and your grain boundary region is based on the difference in elasticity. And so, you know, you could think of maybe some additional effects that could be present in your grain boundary besides just the difference in elasticity and that wouldn't that's not accounted for yet, I guess. But the resolution question is a good one as well, because as I mentioned, now we're applying sort of a width to our grain boundary, which does mean that our computational grid has to be sort of, you know, resolved enough to give us, you know, some points within that grain boundary width for us to really do calculations on. Okay, so for example, for the Local energy, you introduce uh, the step which, which is not near the gradient, but local energy term, how you choose for your increase. Right, so in this case, um, you know, I showed this equation already, right, which is for the order parameter. Essentially, what we're doing is we're adding what you might consider more order parameters, where you have nine, one for each component of your eigenstrain, essentially that you're also minimizing. And so this energy term here, and I'm, I can show you the equations at some other time, um, but you know, these, our total system energy now is coupled between, now it's no longer just a function of the order parameters that are controlling the dislocations, but now it's also a function of the virtual strains. And that's particularly happening in that strain energy term. So um, you're just, so, the way that I like to think about it that's the easiest for me is, for example, if you have a dislocation just stationary in, in your matrix versus in your inclusion, you know, the stress states around it should vary just based on the different elasticity in there. Um, but yeah, I can show you more of the equations off the, and maybe that'll help. Um, but I'm on my summary slide. <laughs> uh, um, so... Yeah, so I mean, I don't need to read this and, and I can answer more questions if you guys want. I think what I'm just showing is that, you know, I think, you know, whether or not grain boundary structure really even matters sort of at the macro scale is hard to determine. And, and how big that effect is for different cases is also hard to determine. And so we're trying to go sort of from a bottom up way to kind of, and like I mentioned, you know, there is some crystal plasticity work going in our project where we hope to really be able to tackle that question. Um, but these are some of the ideas and um, some of the work, a lot of it is sort of development work on these methods um, on how we want to be able to account for this in, at different scales. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions.